The penultimate episode of every season of Game of Thrones has always been a doozy. And this latest episode was no exception. Let's dive right into the details, Easter eggs, references, and other things you might have missed in Game of Thrones Season 7, Episode 6, Beyond the Wall. Earlier this season, we published an article on how the relationship between Daenerys and Tyrion has always been that of equals, and their equality is reflected in the cinematography and blocking, unlike Tyrion's relationship with Cersei or Tywin. In Episodes 4 and 5 of Season 7, however, as Daenerys scolded Tyrion for his spectacular military snafus, we saw that power dynamic shift. She towered over him, and the camera accentuated the stark difference in their statures. The right plan! Now, in Beyond the Wall, we get the strongest example yet of the strain their relationship is undergoing. I don't want you to be a hero. In their first scene alone, we get the sense that Daenerys has finally forgiven Tyrion, sitting to talk to him face to face. Even when she rises to look at the fire, she still meets his gaze from the side, rather than looking down at him dominantly. But then, when Tyrion insists on bringing up the issue of the succession, Daenerys makes it clear that she won't be challenged, not just with her words, but with her body language. We will discuss the succession after I wear the crown. She faces him full on, looking straight down at him. The camera mirrors this positioning, tilting slightly up at Amelia Clark and slightly down at Peter Dinklage. I'm trying to serve you by planning for the long term. Later in the episode, as he pleads with her not to fly north and she ignores him, the camera is almost directly above Dinklage, illustrating just how far out of his reach Daenerys has flown. It's understandable that Daenerys isn't in a hurry to name a successor when she's got White Walkers and the Siege of Westeros to worry about. But Tyrion has a point. If she's going to be off risking her life, she needs to name a successor ASAP. While it almost seemed like Tyrion was insinuating that he would be a good choice, the irony is that there already is a true-born successor to the Targaryen line, Jon Snow. While watching Daenerys ascend the Iron Throne would be the ultimate satisfaction for fans of the Mother of Dragons, we know that we can't always get what we want, especially in Westeros. In this world, when characters insist that something is the case, it will probably never come to pass. The next time we see each other, we'll talk about your mother. The fact that Danny is insisting so strongly on her ascension to the Iron Throne seems like a smidgen of foreshadowing that things won't quite pan out that way. Could our beloved Khaleesi die in the War for the Dawn? Similarly, she seems awfully convinced that she'll never have any human children, and has decided to remind us of that so often it seems downright suspicious. The dragons are my children. They're the only children I'll ever have. With love clearly in the wintry air and an incestuous union almost a certainty, is it possible that Daenerys and Jon could solve the problem of the succession and wrap up the prophecy of ice and fire by producing one more Targaryen toddler? While Arya is busy making bizarre threats about killing her sister, Sansa actually gave us the only useful piece of information we've learned at Winterfell recently. John is not here. I haven't heard from him in weeks. The last form of communication we saw between the two of them was when Sansa wrote to inform him that Arya had returned home. Since the passage of time has become something of a shrug in Season 7, it's nice to get a tiny indication of how long this stuff is actually taking. Assuming John did not tell Sansa about his batshit plan to go north and capture a white, we can assume that he would have responded to her letter about Arya and then left for the wall shortly thereafter. They left Dragonstone by ship, which is the second fastest way to travel, after Dragon Ride, of course, and likely reached Eastwatch in about two weeks. Or three weeks? Something like that. Then a day or two to prep for the mission, and then we can assume they spent at least one night or two out there fighting the undead. So all in all, this whole episode probably spanned the duration of three weeks to a month. However, this is just speculation, so feel free to keep believing in the existence of jetpacks in Westeros if you'd prefer. Who would have guessed that faceless assassins kept their faces in a satchel hidden in the most surreptitious hiding place of all, under the bed? As Sansa finds Arya's stash, she wastes no time in pulling out what appear to be the kind of rubber Halloween masks used by bandits in movies. This is time to rock and roll. But rather than pulling out the face of Richard Nixon or Scooby-Doo, we see two former Westeros terrors, Walder Frey and a mysterious man that some have guessed could be Marin Trant. After Beric Dondarrion makes the pivotal conclusion that killing the Night King would kill the entire undead army, we see Jon Snow once again play the hero as the rest of the gang clamors onto Drogon's back. Jon! As Jon Snow fights off a handful of whites, we watch him lock eyes with the Night King in a moment that parallels Jaime Lannister's dash of stupid heroism toward Danny and Drogon from the spoils of war. For a split second, we think that he might actually try to take him down then and there. 
but when he doesn't, it seems almost a certainty that it'll happen at some point down the line. Just as Jamie wants to take out Daenerys to end the carnage, Jon Snow wanted to take out the Night King. Even Robert Baratheon told the tale of a foolish Charlie boy that tried to end Robert's rebellion by killing him with a stroke of his sword. They never tell you how they all shit themselves. George R.R. R. Martin has long been an advocate of stirring up empathy for parties on both sides of the battlefield, as he did at the Battle of Blackwater and the story about the doomed heroic boy in Robert's Rebellion. While we haven't ever felt much empathy for the Night King, the parallels between these types of stories seem too strong to ignore. In an interview with Collider, Martin gave us the following cryptic quote to contemplate. Nobody is a villain in their own story. We're all the heroes of our own stories. So, when I'm inside the head of a character who would otherwise be considered a villain, I have a great deal of affection for that character, and I'm trying to see the world and the events through their eyes." We already know that the White Walkers have a mysterious and complicated history. As we'll surely start to see more and more of the Night King in Season 8, and some fans have already started theorizing that he may be a very familiar character indeed, it might be time to start entertaining the notion that they're not the mindless killing automatons we've always suspected them to be. With Stark threatening Stark, Miraculous Uncle Savior appearing for the final time, and a dead dragon being infused with the icy breath of pure evil, no one could blame you for failing to notice a little detail like a bluish filter on a fair face. This episode saw Daenerys stand tall on top of the wall, the first time she's ever been in the North. A bit longer. Back in episode 3, when Jon Snow went south, we saw Kit Harington's face for the first time without the perpetual blue-gray filter of the North. Now, for the first time since the House of the Undying, we see the Dragon Queen through the icy lens once reserved for Jon and the other Northerners. Now that she and her new subject, the King in the North, are on a boat back to Dragonstone, and we know that the Night King is heading south, it may very well be the last time we ever get to see Daenerys in this light.